Hi, Guy Moxie, Wolf Speed Power, and welcome to In The Studio. And this is a very special episode of In The Studio because today we're gonna to be dissecting the world according to Wide Band Gap. The whole thing, the full Monty. And for that, I'm really excited to welcome a very special guest, an icon of this industry, Mr. Alex Lido. Alex, welcome. Oh, thanks very much, Guy. Alex, thank you for making it here today because this is gonna be a great discussion. You and I have been in this industry for a year or two and we've seen a lot of changes and a lot happening and a lot of developments and, and progress. So, you know, tell us and myself and the audience, remind me and tell the audience a little bit about yourself, your background and, and how you ended up at EPC and where it's going. So, I, you know, I went to graduate school in the mid 70s uh, looking for the next best thing after silicon because I thought, well, silicon's got to be at the end of the road, right? It's been out 20 years. <laughs> and so I worked on gallium arsenide and uh, it, it, uh, I got my PhD on gallium arsenide, but I knew it wasn't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I took what I learned and I went to International Rectifier uh, and with a friend of mine and we developed the first power MOSFETs. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, didn't, didn't look back for many, many years. Uh, and by the time the turn of the millennium happened, I realized that our MOSFETs were kind of at the end of the road. Okay. Uh, the physics was running out. And so- Getting started a bit looking, tired, sort of thing. Tired, or... but now it hit theoretical limits. Okay. So now, you know, where do you go from there? Mm. Well, you can make incremental improvements, but basically then it, it, it's just a game of commodities. Yes. Uh, so, I started looking at some research that was done in Japan. Uh, it always stayed uh, current technically and uh, saw some new research where they'd grown gallium nitride as a device grade crystal on top of a regular piece of silicon. Okay. And that really set off a flash bulb in my head uh, because that took care of a lot of the problems I'd seen in gallium arsenide for okay. a lot of reasons. Yes. So I started uh, working on that at uh, International Rectifier. We acquired a tiny little company that had been doing some research in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, fortuitously, I, I got fired. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was, it, aside from the trauma of being fired, mm -hmm. it, it made me think about, well, what's the best opportunity going forward? I right. mean, I was in my, uh, mid 50s uh, and now all of a sudden I've got to start over and I thought well the best opportunity I can think of is uh, carbon futures okay because right. of global warming yes yes uh, and during the same and this was in the shower and uh, okay during, the epiphany during, in the shower the epiphany in the shower <laughs> carbon we're gonna do carbon and then I th well maybe not maybe we'll do GAN okay, yeah. <laughs> so you could say it was my second choice but I think it was the better of the two and uh, so I put together a small team and we started working on gallium nitride devices mm -hmm. uh, for the world of power. And on day one, our thesis was, we're gonna make something better than silicon and lower cost. I remember, yes, I do, yes. And that was about a decade ago or so? 15, 15 years 15, ago. 15 yeah. years. And how the, the whole industry has transformed in 15 years has been incredible. I mean, you, you said you joined IR in the late 70s, yeah. early 80s. and. That was a fairly pivotal time for, the, for power. I mean, power has never been ultra fashionable. It's always been there, but kind of behind the fence. And you, know, you and I have been plugging away at this game for a long time. And it's had its booms and busts, yeah. you know, in, in low voltage in particular, with all the ultra portable stuff, we all remember that era. But for, for larger power and more progressive things, as you said, silicon's had a good run and I think it still has a fair, fairly fundamental place in the world, and there's still IRF 630s and 840s around, the good old <laughs> iconic parts there. But you're right, there's now there's, there's more truly commercialized technologies out there that are really being, being embraced, not just science projects anymore, not just sort of advanced R&D. You're seeing from your side of the wide band gap party, um, from the GAN side, you know, your applications, and we'll go into those, and obviously I sit on the silicon carbide fence, and it's different things, but, um, but I do remember you've always been on the progressive side, not just on the leading edge of technology, but also on the adoption of technology, because I remember I was at IR back in the, the mid-90s, and I remember going to El Segundo and seeing you appear one day in a true BEV, and that 
you know, what made you buy in the mid 90s in southern LA in the electric car? That was 20 years before anyone else really got interested. Yeah, yeah, you know, actually I was into it long before that. Uh, I actually built an electric car when I was in high school. I uh, wow. used an old Renault Dauphine with a, uh, an engine that, that was a starter motor from a DC-4 aircraft. It was, a, <laughs> it was a rather primitive thing, but I drove it to school every day. And Road one, legal. Uh, it was, it, well, <laughs> ish, I, ish. don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> and uh, I, I blew out the entire school's electrical system one day. <laughs> Uh, and uh, carefully move the car away from the uh, panel at that time. So I, I was always an aficionado. My father also always believed in it. Uh, and uh, so when I started, uh, when I saw General Motors uh, launching their EV1, I had to have one. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, he got into it, so he had to have uh, a, a car. And so we got the RAV4 electric from Toyota, and then mm -hmm. we got a Honda CRV, and uh, you know, I got an EV2, and you know, it was that kind of a thing. And we had just a wonderful time with it. Brilliant, because right now, you know, let's talk about the EV market. We both share that, that same market in common, but from different perspectives. Obviously, from the silicon carbide side of the camp, more all about volts and amps and driving, turning the wheels, the motor and charging and EPC focus GAN specifically around different areas. But again, it's a great example of why Bangap mutually adopting a, an, an application. So where does the, you know, your GAN focus around EVs? So today, our GAN is, is in cars in a variety of places, mm -hmm. uh, including um, driver alertness systems, you know, so you don't fall asleep ah, if okay. you have a level three. Uh, or even level two kind of ADAS, uh, we're in headlamps, uh, and we're now starting to show up in the 48 volt buses, uh, electrical sense. buses yes. that you see in the um, mild uh, hybrids. Uh, and, and my sense is that electric vehicles are going from a 400 volt distribution bus up to an 800 volt distribution bus. We see that, yes, yeah. absolutely. But yeah. they'll always have to bring it down to a lower voltage, mm -hmm. and that probably will be 48 volts. Mm. And that's a sweet spot for low voltage GAN. Yeah. It's a very, very good spot because higher performance and lower cost in silicon. Yeah, because you and I remember back in the early 2000s, there was a big move for ICE engines to move from 12 to 48. Yes. Never really happened in its entirety, but it is a sweet spot. And, you know, that, that voltage level really, you know, crosses a lot of different applications for GAN. Yeah. Point of load, DC to DC secondary, yeah. And of course, any switch mode coming off 48 down to, to whatever volts. Yeah. And so I'm thinking not only automotive, but netcom, medical, what sort of other areas on, on, on that, around that sort of 48 volt DC? You know, it's, it's a big area. The, the biggest today is in uh, artificial intelligence and, and high density servers. Mm -hmm. That's where the biggest volume is right now in DC to DC. Servers have gone from 12 volts to 48 volts, yep. much like a car is doing, mm -hmm. for just the same reasons. Uh, and, and not only that, but they had to bring the 48 volts from the rack onto the board, and that's the most expensive real estate in the world yes. on a server board. So density is very important, efficiency is important, uh, and I saw that as an opportunity for GAN, because mm -hmm. you know, when if you can make the best thing in the world, but if nobody has a design window open, you're not gonna get any business. That's true. But I knew that the design windows were opening up in that uh, big time. So we immediately got some very high volume applications and, and that's, that's been one of the big drivers and movers today. Because the design cycles of those, you, know, you, you mentioned it exactly, design windows. Automotive is relatively slow, even though it seems to be going quite quickly compared to traditional automotive. Mm -hmm. Um, but the server cycle is typically two to three years. It's not necessarily driven, consumer driven. You don't steam out and buy a load more servers for Christmas. Right. Um, but the design cycle is open. Power density is key. All the energy efficiency standards coming in that we see further upstream, you see further downstream. Um, but what about if we, if we focus on, you, know, you mentioned some lower voltages as well. Where does, in your mind, GAN stop at the, at the lower voltage level? Because there's plenty of cell phones, tablets, single cell, two, three, four cell lithium ion product out there. It's a massive market. Yeah. Do you see GAN going lower voltage below, you know, down to the five volts and three volt type sort of areas? 
So I, I'm I'm some somewhat opinionated, Ooh, uh, controversial, yeah, yes, exactly, yeah. uh, and opinionated. Yeah. I, I think silicon is dead for power. Okay. Now it might have a long <laughs> zombie life, but it's dead. Uh, I think GAN is going to just do it all from 650 down to about 20 volts. Right. And below 20 volts, it'll be like BCD MOS technology on silicon yeah. and things like that. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's the range that that GAN is is focusing on, and GAN has a, a another dimension to it that that power MOSFETs and silicon don't in that you can integrate power devices, multiple power devices yes. on a single chip, which yes. you can't in silicon. That's a yeah. big deal. It is, and that gives you a huge flexibility as well. And, you know, I too agree that silicon is struggling. You know, I see you've got a webinar coming up, GAN versus silicon smackdown. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> um, so down at that, you know, you said down to 20 volts, the sweet spot, you mentioned a particular sweet spot being around the 48 volts, so you're looking at 100 volt, 150 volt rated devices. What happens if you start upping the voltage? Because I know EPC have, have got a very strong portfolio that really stops at 200. But as you mentioned, GAN can scale up to 600, 650 in a lateral way. Vertical would have to go probably higher, would, would need to be go higher. And then obviously we get into my side of the camp where we get out of bed at 600 volts. Yeah. So what's your opinion around that sort of 600 volt space between between the wide, gam, ba wide band gap technologies? That's difficult to say, isn't it? So, so uh, you know, I, I think that, that GAN, as it gets uh, higher and higher in voltage, as a lateral device, you have to separate the terminals farther and farther apart yep. just for, you know, breakdown voltage clearance, spaces. Yes. Yeah. clearance, exactly. Uh, and that's why at about 650 volts or so, it makes more sense to have a vertical device. Yes. Because you, you, you save that whole problem. Uh, so the GAN, either GAN has to go vertical mm -hmm. or you got to go to silicon carbide. Now, I don't believe in GAN going vertical. I am controversial there too. I, I, think, I, I, think it's I, I agree with you, by the way. I've seen some <laughs> academia, MIT driven stuff, but full commercialism vertical, I agree with your statement, definitely. Yeah, now the reason I say it is because I, I, you know GAN doesn't have any advantage over silicon carbide the minute you go vertical. Yeah. Uh, not only that, but silicon carbide is a more mature technology, so it's got you know it's farther down that runway, mm -hmm. and its its thermal properties are much better than GAN. That's correct. Uh, yeah. So I think that that there's really no reason to go vertical in GAN. Just go to silicon carbide. Yeah. And there's plenty of market around that 400 to 600 volt space. You mentioned it, integration, gate drivers, controllers, sensing, um, you know, the consumer market is probably not a silicon carbide space because we really, you know, we get out of bed at 600 volts, but we start getting active when we start bringing to amps into the equation and die size. So when you look at, you, know, you mentioned the silicon market in its entirety, depends on who you speak to, $20 billion, including modules, something of that nature, isn't it? Across the whole span, yeah, the, TAM, that, yeah. the TAM. There's plenty to go around, mm -hmm. absolutely plenty. Yeah. So what other newer emerging applications that you, you guys have been focusing on at EPC? You mentioned automotive, but there's lots of other end systems that are getting the EPC GAN treatment. Yeah, you know, GAN is going just about everywhere. There, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds of applications. Uh, for example, GAN is, or can be if you build it right, um, virtually immune to radiation. Mm -hmm. And that, for that reason, one of the early adopters was satellites. And we have you know, over 100,000 of these parts now in orbit around the Earth, with hundreds of thousands going every, uh, you know, every year now. Right. Uh, so that was a big deal because uh, you know, space electronics are pretty uh, you know, uh, cherished. Yes, absolutely. And silicon is very delicate in the radiation environment. So that was yeah. a big one. Uh, low volume, but very, very good uh, high, high profit margin market, uh, market, certainly. Another very big one uh, that, that has already um, emerged, it was actually the, the first one to emerge, was uh, three-dimensional uh, measurements. Uh, okay. We all know that uh, you know, autonomous cars have LiDAR systems on yes, them. Yes, of course. That's a three-dimensional uh, you know, measurement tool yeah. that spins around or it scans or whatever it is. That was one of our first volume applications. Uh, and now, you don't even realize it, but LiDAR systems are just about everywhere. Yes, if you have right. one of those vacuum cleaners that goes around aut autonomously on your floor, that has eight LiDAR mm -hmm. systems on it. Or a lawnmower or 
you know, ranging up to cars and everything else. Yeah. Right, and even yeah. the driver alertness systems in cars now are using LiDAR because LiDAR can see oh, through okay. dark glasses, yes. right. so it knows what you're looking at. Yeah, yeah. yes. Uh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> I saw it, an incredible uh, driver alertness system, I won't tell you the car manufacturer, but it actually could tell you the mood of the driver. Oh dear. And That's it had a moodometer <laughs> and it actually dialed down the performance if it was angry. Oh, that's a very sensible thing, actually, when you think about that's it. That's a little scary. Yeah. I have to put it in my wife's car. So, you know, I think that the LiDAR actually, you know, went into the millions of units. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, this DC to DC for, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, which has a very fast design cycle, went next, and then servers. Uh, and uh, and now we're seeing the emergence of these e-mobility applications like yeah. electric uh, scooters and even tut tuts uh, and drones. Yes. And those are all big GAN fans because you know if it's got to be smaller and lighter weight and more efficient, you know go to GAN. Yeah. Especially and, yeah. lower voltages. Yeah, based off a 48 volt battery, a 72 volt yeah. battery, that type of thing. It's fascinating, Alex, that all of these are not all of them, but a lot of them are brand new applications that we would never have thought of even 15 years ago. Yeah. You know, we would have been still plugging away at the DC to DC bricks and the welding machines of this world, which are, you know, bread and butter staples of the industry. These, even an EV, is, mm. is still a new application. Yeah. And the, pro, and the progression from there, you know, we're getting excited from our, from our end. You know, we don't have any LiDAR, but from our end is obviously all around the EV, but even fundamentally reshaping and shaking up the, the energy industry, the solar, the, the energy storage going into wind. Oh yes, solar is a big one yeah. uh, for GAN and, and for silicon carbide. Yes. Yeah, it's a very big one. Interesting perspective, Alex, for sure. Yeah. So I won't take up any more of your time. It's been brilliant to have you here, and I know you've got to rehearse your GAN versus silicon smackdown <laughs> webinar. <laughs> I do that, that every night. <laughs> <laughs> Join me for part two with Alex Lido from EPC. In the studio, wolfspeed.com. See you there.